January 2003, a psychic has a vision of a violent murder in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I felt terrified. She sees the killer's face. He had black hair, he had brown eyes, he had a very round, full face. But her description is ignored by the police. A serial killer is on the loose. More women could die if no one listens. In May 2002, Murray Pace, a 22-year-old graduate assistant at Louisiana State University, leaves work early to attend a friend's wedding. Two hours later, her roommate returns to the apartment to find her brutally murdered. In the following weeks, three more women are attacked. The Baton Rouge police then announce that DNA evidence links Marie Pace's murder to that of two other women. They are now dealing with a vicious serial killer who might also be behind the savage rape and murder of a number of other women in the area since 1990. The town is gripped by fear. It was panic. You had uh, uh, ladies asking for uh, self-defense courses. You had a major sale in pepper spray. People were worried, worried about their daughters. To catch the killer, the Baton Rouge Police Department sets up a task force together with the FBI and other local forces. Detective McDavid with the Zachary Police suggests as prime suspect a local peeping Tom who's been causing trouble for years. Evidently, we put so much pressure on him that it began moving into the Baton Rouge area. Unfortunately, he doesn't match the serial killer profile used by the FBI. The majority of the profiles that, that we were getting from the FBI at the time were generic, uh, pretty much a white male in his mid-30s that lives at home, lives with his mother or a loner. The Zachary suspect is ignored. The FBI have witnesses to back up their profile. One reports a white male driving a pickup truck with a naked female slumped on the passenger seat. She looked dead. It was near the Whiskey Bay exit on Interstate 10, close to where the body of another victim had been found. Another witness sees a suspicious-looking white man near where a woman had been killed while visiting her mother's grave. She'd been beaten to death. By December 2002, the serial killer has taken two more women. A white man is seen near one of the bodies. The task force starts taking DNA samples of thousands of white males. They were taking DNA samples from people that they thought may have had uh, uh, some connection in the neighborhood where the homicides occurred, or people that drove a white truck, or uh, males that were in a certain age bracket. At the end of December, the task force released their first composite sketch of the killer. He's a 25 to 35 year old white male, apparently physically strong and awkward with women. But six months later, they still have no suspect. Ann Williams, a forensics consultant and former lawyer, teaches a college course in forensic investigation. She's worked on a number of cold cases and wants to help out on this one. I knew there was talk of a serial killer. And I decided to call Jeannie Borgen who has worked some cases with me as a police psychic. And I had contacted Murray's mother, Ann Pace, and gotten Murray's birth information, which is what Jeannie needs to work on these cases as a psychic. Murray's mother decides to join Ann's forensics class. She wanted to be there for Murray. Um, she said that she was there when Murray was born, and she couldn't be there when it mattered most, when Murray died. Ann Williams called me. And she told me she had a woman in her class by the name of Ann Pace, and that she had lost a daughter and that she had been murdered. I had uh, Murray's birth certificate name and birth date. And I used that as a method of psychometry. In other words, I'm touching and I'm examining the name, and then I get the vision. I sort of ask for the vision uh, mentally. 
Anne often has forensics experts call in and talk to students on the speakerphone about cases they've worked on. So she sets up a conference call with Jean in California. Well, we're all here to talk to you, my class. The first thing that I saw was a house. Very neat house, a neat manicured lawn, very peaceful. I had seen him on a street corner looking at the apartment building. She didn't know him, but she had seen him. So he was familiar to her. She was not overwhelmed or frightened. He can be very personable. But suddenly he got very violent. And he attacked. This girl fought back for every blow she got, she gave him one. But he had a knife. And it was a brutal fight. And I was stuck in the picture, I couldn't get out. I knew that the final moments that she had to die with something of the throat. And he did, he did cut her throat. I felt terrified. It was like Murray and I were one at that point. I had to sit there and watch her die. It, it was really hard. As it ended, he straightened up and he looked at me. And it was like I, I was looking eye to eye with him. I started shaking inside and then I had little butterflies. And then he disappeared. When I looked at him, um, I thought he was probably um, about 5'10 to 6 feet. He was um, Afro-American. He had black hair. He had brown eyes. He had a very round, full face. And then he had this little goatee. He had a mustache, but then there was other times that I picked him up, he did not have a mustache. Someone in the class asked her, well, what's he wearing, this, this Baton Rouge serial killer? She said, well, right now, she says, I'm seeing him in blue dickies. And I said, well, what are dickies? I mean, I didn't even know. And the class laughed, and they said, those are work pants, you know. With Murray's mother verifying the known details of the murder, the class are stunned by the realism of the psychic's vision. But Anne Williams is uneasy. When Jean first described the serial killer as being a light-complected black man, I just thought she was off. I didn't believe it, because, you know, statistically, he would be a white man, and that's what they said they were looking for. Can Anne's investigation be of any help to the task force if Jeannie's vision is so off on such a key point? January 2003, Baton Rouge is being terrorized by a serial killer. A task force is set up to catch him, they believe he's a white man and take DNA samples of over 2,000 men. But six months later, they still have no suspect. Forensics consultant Anne Williams wants to help. She involves her friend, psychic Jeannie Borgen, who has a stark vision of the murder of one of the killer's victims. But in her vision, the killer is a light-skinned African-American. Anne thinks she's wrong. Ann was right. You don't positively make a statement about a suspect until you're absolutely certain. But Ann has worked with Jeannie before, and the psychic's accurate description of the murder persuades her not to give up too easily. Over the following months, Jeannie has constant visions of the killer. I was tuning in on, on him every night. He was in the car a lot. She sees him at Whiskey Bay, off Interstate 10, where the bodies of two earlier victims were found. Jeannie is convinced there are more. With her friend, Chip Bowman, Ann Williams tries to find the places Jeannie sees in her visions. If they find another body, it might lead them to the killer. They photograph likely locations and send her the pictures. Well, I think probably if we take pictures anywhere around here, it'll be helpful to Jeannie because who knows where he would have dumped somebody. Then we could go back the opposite end where Pam Kenamore's body was found to that north area, that wooded area that Jeannie's interested in and take some shots of that. Okay. Okay, thanks. Well, it's very, very hard because I have to have a fix. I have to see a certain tree or I have to see 
something that looks like what I'm seeing. Jeannie tries to guide them through the landscapes of her visions. I can't believe this, Jeannie. We're actually seeing what you're telling us. Listen, you need to go uh, to your right. There's going to be a big line of trees there. Yeah, all right, now wait a minute. When he walked into the line of trees, there was like a culvert there and he tripped. There is a dip in the ground, just like, like you said, I cannot believe this. But finding a body in this vast wilderness requires a massive search and time is running out. Jeannie begins to sense the killer's moods. He really did not like women, especially women who were mentally above him or he felt superior to him. These women were basically the same. They were professional women. I mean, we had two homicides in Zachary, which is a, in the parish, uh, that were fairly consistent with uh, what was happening in, in Baton Rouge. It was almost a, um, a hate sexual type of a situation. Jeannie senses the killer is ready to strike again. The energy had been building in him as he watched the person for maybe weeks. He did a lot of surveillance, what we can tell, on these victims' houses. He knew their movements, uh, knew when they come outside, he knew who was at the house. And then when it got powerful in the body, he went for it. And I knew that this was a man who had to kill. As the killer's bloodlust becomes stronger, Jeannie has a terrible vision. I thought I had another victim. And then suddenly I realized she's alive. <laughs> and it was like, oh my God, she's alive. And this is, she's gonna be one of the future victims. And then at that point I thought, but where is she? Where do I go from here? The killer is already stalking his next victim. As Jeannie tries desperately to see where the attack might happen, the landscape of her visions becomes more recognizable. He stood one night looking out at the water, and I saw these beautiful white birds fly over the water. That was at, I think that was at the foot of Stanford Avenue. Two of the killer's victims had lived on Stanford Avenue. Does his new victim also live here? With time running out, Anne and Chip scour the area. The next thing I got was a house. It was a greenhouse. It had two trees on both sides, like this, like, like a frame, and it had bushes in front. That had to be where she lived. But I, I couldn't quite figure out, I couldn't get anything that would give me a sign as to where it was at. And then finally a breakthrough. Anne and Chip locate one of Jeannie's visions. He went to this place that was sort of a, a little restaurant with a big television. When I got the picture of this little restaurant, it wasn't much, but I was overjoyed that they had found it. So I thought that he probably frequent that a lot. But tragically, they are too late. On March 13, 2003, the body of 26-year-old Carrie Yoder is found at Whiskey Bay. Once again, the killer had been careful not to leave any fingerprints. But he did leave one important evidence on the body, that was his DNA, which is similar, similar to a, a fingerprint. DNA evidence shows she's a victim of the same man who killed Murray Pace. The man the task force are convinced is white, but who appears in Jeannie's visions as a light-skinned African-American. But as far as the description of this light-complected black man, I just didn't buy that. He's white. She's wrong. Then, some days later, while talking to Murray's old roommate, Anne makes an extraordinary discovery. She told me about some neighbors of Murray's who had seen a suspicious man standing across the street staring at Murray's townhouse the morning she was murdered. They each went to the police that day and gave their description. None of them knew the other had seen him, but the police weren't interested. They had a profile they were working from that this is a white man. So they just totally ignored credible witnesses that day. So the neighbors posted their testimonies on a well-known website. Said uh, that this guy was a light-complected black man wearing blue dickies with a wannabe goatee. And I, 
I said, you gotta be kidding. I was trying to figure out, well, the police won't come do a sketch, so what can I do? So I wound up ordering some software that the police use. Together with Karen Savoy, one of Murray's neighbors, Anne puts together a composite sketch of the man they saw watching Murray's house the day she was murdered. I don't see anything there. Could we um, go down? Let's try 812. Wanna try it? No. No, I don't think so. And huh? Rounded on the So it needs flatter? Yes. OK. But we'll not, keep going. Not, so, not as broad as the one that I liked. I what think about it was 836. What about that one? Jeannie confirms this is the man she saw in her visions and sends it to the task force. Anne and I were talking constantly about what we could do to get the police to recognize that this was a black man, not a white man. But they just didn't seem to look at it as far as we knew. Once we got these sketches and everything, I drafted a letter. And I put their verbal description of this guy, because that's the most important thing, and how to reach these witnesses, and that they really would like to speak with law enforcement and hopefully do a professional sketch. And I sent that. I overnighted it to Governor Foster and then to the task force. And I didn't get any response from them. But when she tried to produce the, the sketch to the task force, uh, they turned it down. They didn't want to hear about it. It was a white male they were looking for. Although the police agree that the witnesses all saw the same man, Anne is not allowed to release the sketch. He said, well, you know, we already have a sketch. We don't want another sketch out there. Um, you're not a professional sketch artist. I said, well, I know. I said, but who did your other sketch, you know, from Lafayette? He said, well, that was a professional sketch artist. I said, well, that sketch doesn't look like anybody on this planet. A month later, in April 2003, police in nearby Zachary received fresh complaints about a peeping Tom in a neighborhood where two women were previously raped and murdered. The neighbor across the street here called in and stated that a black male was standing at this window right here, peeping at this window. The lady that lived here was a school teacher. She was a single mom who had one child here. We saw several footprints here at the window sill. Uh, we followed these prints and they went around the corner right here and went down the uh, fence line right here and took off in, in the neighborhood. Zachary police think it's the same peeping Tom who some years earlier they suspected of a vicious attack on two teenagers with a machete at the local cemetery. Uh, two teenagers were parking in the uh, graveyard yard here. Uh, it was a very stormy night, a lot of lightning going on. Uh, one of our officers came down the road right here and saw the dome light on in the car, knowing that nobody was supposed to be in the graveyard that time of night. He came in here and stopped and got his flashlight out and checked and saw two teenagers in there covered in blood. And they began screaming. Uh, he called for help, said that the, uh, a black male had came to them and began cutting them up with a big hack blade. He saw the police officer drive up. He reached back in the car and took a set of keys and let, fled the scene. Working with the victims, police did a sketch of the attacker. It looks just like the peeping Tom. His name is Derek Todd Lee. They suggested him to the task force, but they aren't interested in a black peeping Tom. They believe the serial killer is white. If they won't listen to colleagues, reliable witnesses, or even an experienced psychic, how many more women will die before the killer is caught? A savage serial killer is preying on the town of Baton Rouge. The police are hunting a white man, but psychic Jeannie Borgen believes he's African-American. And while Anne Williams and photographer Chip Bowman try to find the places she sees him in, the killer strikes again. Meanwhile, police in nearby Zachary think the killer could be a black peeping Tom who's been plaguing their town for years. With fresh complaints of the peeping Tom in their area, Zachary police now reopened the file of their main suspect, Derek Todd Lee. Apart from his peeping Tom offenses, Lee has also been in jail for various burglaries and for beating his girlfriend. We worked out a timeline and we worked, saw where he had a job, uh, when he didn't have a job. The timeline showed them something startling. 
When he was in prison, uh, we didn't have no murders. Uh, when he was out, we began having problems in, in the area. Meanwhile, in Baton Rouge, the task force get lucky. There were witnesses to the abduction of Carrie Yoder. Police now release a second sketch of the serial killer and announced that he could in fact be of any race, not necessarily white. This is sweet music to McDavid's ears. In the back in your mind, you, you want to go out and say, I told you so. Was a likeness of a black male that, that uh, was also similar to a sketch that was produced by Ann Williams. Now, psychic Jeannie Borgen has a terrifying premonition. The killer is about to strike again. At this point, I knew he would kill if he had the chance. But the clues are too vague. Ann Williams feels helpless to prevent it. She says, well, I'm getting a woman missing in Alabama. And she said, she's a pretty brunette. And um, I said, well, I don't know. I haven't heard anything about a woman in Alabama. Then, Melinda McGee disappears from her home in Mobile, Alabama. Her body is never found. Finally, in May 2003, McDavid gets a court order to take a DNA swab from Derek Todd Lee. My partner, Trevor Hannah, and me drove up there and we found him out in the yard. He saw me get out the vehicle and began getting upset and told them to tell me to leave. He knew, you know, that I was after him. In 1998, I interviewed Lee in the Maybe murder. And after interviewing him, you know, I looked him in his face, you know, because he, he was real cocky. And I told him, so I know what you did, I'm gonna get you one day. The sample is sent to the crime lab to be analyzed. Lee now takes his two children out of school and leaves town. Some days later, the analyst at the DNA lab makes the discovery that seals Lee's fate. His DNA matches that of the serial killer. McDavid is called in to see the task force. I walked in, everybody just, their eyes were on me. And I said, I kind of glanced back and looked around. And uh, I'm not for sure who said it. They come up to me and said, y'all just solved the serial killer. Y'all's DNA swab matched the serial killer. Oh, I was elated. I was excited. I mean, tears came to my eyes. The task force now officially identify the serial killer. It's Derek Todd Lee. Police track Lee to a cheap motel in Atlanta. The officers just miss him as they arrive. Following a tip-off, they finally arrest him outside a tire store. The minute I heard his name, it was like, that's him. They got him. It was just pure elation. On the 12th of October, 2004, a jury takes just 80 minutes to find Derek Todd Lee guilty of the first-degree murder of Charlotte Murray Pace. He's also indicted for the murders of six other women. This is the kind of case, these serial killings, where a psychic can be very helpful because you don't have a DNA database. And oftentimes, people are, are surprised to learn many police agencies are not well-trained or well-equipped to deal with these kinds of, of stranger killings. This case was very difficult because it was like working on 15 cases rather than just one case. I got frustrated, so frustrated that I couldn't get on top of him fast enough to catch him. It was a relief off my shoulders because since 1992 we've been battling these murders and, and I made a commitment to myself before I retired I was going to solve these murders. I would hope that the sketch we did maybe help convince them that Derek Todd Lee was the man they were after. Um, I hope so. Lee is given the death penalty and is awaiting execution at Angola Prison. It was a victory for law enforcement. Uh, it was a victory for our city. In the town of Zachary, you know, people still leave the doors unlocked, you know, and uh, not looking over their shoulders. And now they can still do that. They can go out and walk freely and not worry about that.